Good morning and welcome to Snow Hill's Sunday online Sunday morning Bible study. And uh, we are continue to be glad that we have this particular way to make connection with those of you who um, feel much better still during the high numbers in the pandemic of, of joining us online rather than in person. And we want you to know that's not setting up two classes of people, two different groups, one favorite above the other. We're just talking about different medium or different ways that we can look at the scriptures together because in the end, whether we're sitting around a table in the classroom at our building or whether we're on a Zoom uh, call that uh, we post to Facebook, we're just interested in getting together around the scriptures. And so whatever way we can do that, we feel God's given us the capacity to do more than just one thing. And so that's what we're, we're doing today. So you can see my uh, compadre on the uh, uh, other screen. So Paul, say hello. Hello, everyone. Hope everybody's had a good week and uh, ready to kick off a new one. Yeah. And so with that, um, I want to, I had to make an adjustment on my little screen thing. So uh, just ignore me sometimes when that's going on. We're just making sure things are going really well. So hopefully you've grabbed your Bible and, and maybe a cup of coffee, glass of orange juice, um, chocolate, milk, whatever you know, your fancy is, and uh, maybe a notepad. And remember, always want to encourage you, if you have a question, uh, a comment, input, please don't hesitate. We keep track of what's published on Sunday and, and look to see, is there anything we need to uh, respond to? So let me ask Paul to lead us in prayer as we start and we'll get underway. So Paul, lead us. All right. God, thank you again for uh, drawing us together and for your word and for uh, your constant drive to speak to us and to move among us. And uh, we just pray that as we are gathered today, that that will all happen yet again. Uh, Lord, you know our needs, and we ask you to meet those. Um, and today, as we gather, we uh, ask for your presence and uh, give us ears to hear your voice. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, uh, when I met Charlie Sheldon some years ago, he was into uh, ham radio. And I learned later on, after I got to know Charlie better, that there was from time to time these games that these uh, uh, radio operators would practice. And, and they would have, um, we would call them like uh, uh, scavenger hunts. And what would happen is someone would go out somewhere and they would, uh, they would put what, what's called a geocache, some object somewhere. And then by, by radio and some other means, they would all go out. Now let's go find that thing. Paul did that for you last week. He planted a seed deep into our 45, 50 minute conversation where he said, next week, I've got something I want to uh, draw out when we're talking about uh, a God who's on mission or we want to refer to God as the missionary God. So before uh, I ask him to uh, step into that, I'm going to set him up by reading a passage of scripture. Now, it's a familiar passage to many of us. It's in Genesis 12. Now, before we get to Genesis 12, we learn that for some reason, uh, Abram's dad had decided to kind of start moving somewhere. And it's just a little known, little kind of clip and kind of a sort of a genealogical section. And then we get what we find in Genesis 12. And I wanted to read that to kind of set Paul up. And it's set up in a good way. This is not setting up to catch him, but setting up in a good way. Now the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. 
So, Paul, you had a thought upon doing a little bit of reading, and then and it was like you said it was like, oh, I hadn't, I kind of hadn't considered that. So, walk us through that discovery a little bit. Yeah. So, um, thinking about God as a, a missionary God and one who sends, um, I it got me to thinking about the the times in Scripture where God sends someone, um, and Abraham was mentioned in a book that uh, we're kind of reading together uh, about this, and it it kind of struck me. I I had the question: Why did God call Abraham out of Ur to send him to the land of Canaan to give him that land? because he was from somewhere. It tells us in that passage that you read that he had a country and he had a land and he lived in his father's house. So he had a house, and even if it was his father's, eventually it would have been his. So he had all of that where he was. Why then move him somewhere? And if if you were to look at a, if we were to look at a map of where he went, Ur would have been somewhere in most likely somewhere in modern day Iraq, and the straight path to get into the land of Canaan, what is today Israel, would have been straight across the desert, and so he didn't go that way. You you really couldn't go that way, well, and survive it. So. He traveled what's known as the Fertile Crescent. You kind of leave there and you, you make kind of a, a curved path to the north and then you come back down through, uh, through the north, south into Canaan. Why send him on that long journey to a place he had never seen, among a people he had never met, with nothing but what he could take with him? Why? Why send him? It it just it could not God have made Abraham the promise that he made him and locate it where he already was. Hmm. Just leave him just leave him alone where he is and say, hey, here you are. You live in this land of Ur. You've got a country to call your own. I'm going to make you great in this country. It would be like, you know, a lot of American kids grow up and their dream is to be the president one day. It, it's, it's, and it's to be the president of the United States, not to be the president of some country somewhere else. Um, but here it's like God saying, Abraham, I'm going to make you into something, just not here, just not where you're from. So I'm going to send you to this other place. And it, it listen, I, I don't want to draw too much out of that. And I don't want to make too much out of that. It's not like we can form a doctrine of God's mission out of my question, why would God send Abraham somewhere else? I think it's just an illustration that came to my mind that God is a God who sends. He he. In John 3, 16, God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. In Hebrews 1, God has spoken to us many times in many ways in the past through prophets and so forth. But in these last days, he has sent us his son. Um, Moses, God sends Moses to Pharaoh uh, in Egypt. The, the Bible is full of stories of God sending and I just think it's all uh, a, together. It's very illustrative of the fact that it's just it just seems to be in the nature of God to be a sending God. Uh, he doesn't have to be. He, uh, like I said, he could have left Abraham where he was. But as I think through it, I think, well, wh why would he do that? I mean, I. I I don't. I didn't just ask the question to myself, just you know, because I thought it was an interesting question. But of course, when you ask those kind of questions, you start to work your way to some possible answers as well. Well, what could it have been? Why? Why might he have done that? 
And of course it doesn't tell us. So yes, it's all conjecture, but I'm gonna make a little conjecture that it might be that God did that as a means of letting Abraham know the kind of God that he is, that he is a sending God, that what he intends to do, and, and I mean, God's promise was that he would make them a fa the father of a great nation, but it would be a great nation so that all the world would be blessed, not just so that his descendants would be blessed, but that through him, all the world would be blessed. And so uh, maybe that was a part of getting that point through to Abram, that I'm going to bless the world through you. And just to show you that I mean the world, I'm going to uproot you from your home. And you're going to do this somewhere else. And that somewhere else will become a new home for you. But as the writer of Hebrews tells us, Abraham never uh, took that to mean that the land of Israel was a permanent home. So it's kind of like God saying, I'm giving you a new home, but don't get co too comfortable. <laughs> um, because that uh, Hebrew says that Abraham traveled as a wanderer in the land that God had promised him because he was looking for a city whose builder and architect was God. He, he understood that there was something larger at play there. Yes. And so, um, I, I mean, I think it's kind of a message to us then, maybe that, hey, don't get too comfortable where you are. Um, God is sending us into the world. And so anyway, that, that was my aha moment, my epiphany uh, that I had uh, recently, so. Well, and I, I think that um, when you uh, draw out some of the particular uh, emphases that you made along the way um, does give us a point at which as we kind of continue this looking at this particular way to think about the character essential nature of God that we then can kind of make some uh, connections to so for instance I got to thinking as you were talking that one of the things about that movement was that Abraham, Abram would have to learn to trust in the midst of going to an unknown place. So part of teaching him what trust looked like was to give him an unspecified destination so that here he leaves the familiar and the question is always going to end up being is, um, how am I going, how do I know you're there? And, and so we see that with a few decisions that he made along the way in the course of his life, that he was also feeling his way about what does that trust look like? I mean, we could talk about um, his fear of um, other uh, leaders taking his wife from him. We could talk about the uncertainty about how is it in the world he's going to be a father of a great nation when he they can't have children. So it seems to me that one of the things that uh, figures prominently is that we're always on this journey of learning to trust. And some days, man, we are fantastic at it. Some days we're just excellent. We're just, you know, those are the moments where we, in our particular way we like to talk about it. I feel so close to the Lord and and I just I just feel his presence and then we get into a circumstance and um, we don't quite feel that way and then we're not sure and we're not sure exactly what to do about those particular moments and someone like Abram someone like hey Pat someone like Moses, um, would uh, be a character who would help us because both those guys were journeying people would help us ourselves make that connection so that we can remember that there were moments along the way where um, God didn't uh, didn't always feel as present as you know we think that maybe that implies but instead we learn that God was indeed always present with Abram. Abram just had to learn to un and had to learn and understand all the ways that God was with him. 
So I think I think that that as we go along, that might be a really good thing, Paul, that we kind of draw out because I remember back to your, um, you, you know, one of your favorite lines in one of our prior studies is, so what does it mean? Like, so what's the difference? What's the point? And so that we could uh, be good Baptists, for instance, who have three major mission offerings every year, and then some little ones along the way beside that, um, who immediately we hear missionary, we have this thing that comes to mind that we might make some connections because the other thing we don't want to do, the other thing we don't want to do is automatically assume that God has no sending for us if it's not from Iraq to Israel. And so um, what we hope to do, folks, uh, as we continue kind of this, uh, introduce this thinking about how we understand God as a missionary God, ascending God, um, is that, that we're going to make these points along the way because some of you are in places where I'll never be. And it's probably pretty good for you to understand that God has sent you there. And that instead of just going like, oh, I happened to land here or, oh, I, you know, it just happened to be the best job available. We need to kind of narrate our lives in such a way that because we're his, wherever we are, it's where God sends us. And, uh, and so uh, equally, we need to kind of be uh, open to the reality that no matter your age or your situation, God may indeed be sending you from Israel to Iraq, for, for instance. Uh, so um, I think this is a really important kind of idea that's clearly in Scripture to get that describes the uh, uh, character. And remember, I know that the, uh, and just so you know, we're reading a book by a friend of mine. His name's John Frankie, and uh, John taught at uh, one of the seminaries I, I helped work with back in the early 2000s and helped lead some courses and, and that sort of thing. And uh, John and I became friends, and he wrote um, a, a little theology book, an introduction really to how do we think about God as, as missionary. And so that's what Paul and I are kind of looking at. And to be frank, you like that Frank E. Frank Lee? Frankly, uh, I want you to know that these are not new ideas to say, well, Paul and Todd, they, they made this discovery. These are really some things that have been floating around for about 20 years in what we call missiological, that is the study of missions. These, these have been things that have been going on. In fact, the idea of the mission of God goes back to some conferences uh, in the last century. And so these aren't new, but they've been new ways to many of us to say, how can we talk about that to capture the imagination that tells the stories in a way that we really get another angle of God revealing himself and what that means. And so God is a, a missionary God or a God on mission or ascending God um, is, is really central to some of what some of us grew up as being being Baptist and always talking about missionaries, inviting them to come and taking up mission offerings and supporting missionaries around the world. Um, so uh, I think this will hopefully be uh, uh, helpful along the way. Um, Paul, when we when we think about that, because we want to we want to tie uh, an Old Testament image here to how God's revealed Himself in Jesus. I mean, we're, we've done now this since last April, I think. So we're, we'll be a year doing our online Bible study here before long. And one of the things that we, one way or another, whether directly or indirectly, have tried to communicate with our Bible study folks is that um, uh, we read the Bible through the lens of Jesus, and that it doesn't help us to read the Bible and try to fit Jesus into that uh, idea. But God's finally revealing himself in Jesus, as you referenced Hebrews 1. So it forces us to read backwards into the scripture to say, okay, what does this tell us about Jesus? And if we've understood a particular passage a particular way, 
how do we need to adjust that in light of who Jesus is? And so when we, when we think about that, we, we have to may, may want to think about this uh, notion that, that uh, ties in with uh, the Trinity that we talked about with the uh, Nicene Creed. And that's this, that Jesus makes this statement to the disciples as the father has sent me. So send I you. So right there, uh, Jesus is asserting that this sending idea, this missionary idea is something that existed in the heart, mind, and purpose of God. Well, we've got to assume from beginning. So how, what are some things that come to mind for you when, when we're talking about some of the things we've broached, whether we're talking about Nehemiah, or we're talking about the Nicene Creed, or now we're talking about the mission sending God, the missionary God, the sending God. What, what, are some, what are some things that we would want to make a connection with when we are kind of pulling some of those themes together and we hear Jesus say, as the Father sent me, what comes to mind for you? Well, uh, I, I'll, I'll be honest. What comes to mind for me today is not the same thing that necessarily uh, has always come to mind for me. Uh, if you'd asked me this, you know, a half a lifetime ago, I would have probably told you that uh, what comes to mind is going to be a missionary somewhere in another land. Um, and and I do think that that is part of it. Uh, I, I don't want to say that it's not that, and now I think it's this other thing. It, it's that I think it is that but also this other thing. And that is that um, man, when I was a kid, it was like, uh, th there were a lot of my peers that were afraid of God calling them to missions because they didn't want to uproot themselves from a culture and a place that was familiar to them and move thousands of miles away from uh, anyone that they knew and start from scratch and learn a new language and a new culture and all of that. And of course, we know even from experience from people who've been sent by our own uh, mission boards, our, our uh, international mission board, that it can be very difficult. Um, in fact, they if you have teenage children, they won't send you because they uh, have determined that there's a high failure rate uh, if you have teenage children because when you've got a kid at that age, they've already got so much going on trying to figure out who they are, uh, what their independence is, what life is going to look like for them and all that, that to do all that in, a, in an unfamiliar context that uh, doesn't have really any support outside of your own immediate family, you know, no friend that you can get on the phone with and, and talk through those things. Uh, about or, or or any of that that uh, it it just doesn't work well. So um, that's kind of in the context of well, God's going to send me somewhere, and and, and here's how it ch how it's changed for me that God's already sent you somewhere. Mm -hmm. I mean, where are you? Mm -hmm. um, I we were born and raised in Oklahoma City. And I kind of had my life mapped out um, from the time I was 16 anyway. I believe that God had called me into pastoral ministry, and so I was going to go to OBU. I was going to go to seminary, and when I got done with that, I was going to pastor churches uh, from that point forward. And um, I, I went to OBU, and I went to seminary, and um, it, I, I was having difficulty finding a church that really wanted a single pastor because um, I wasn't married at the time. Um, and, and that that took me on uh, a journey of, of trying to figure out, well, what does all this mean? And so I spent some time as a, um, a chaplain uh, at, at Presbyterian Hospital. Um, eventually, it would, you know, I'd, I'd get married and it would take me to um, Lindsay, Oklahoma, and then uh, it would take me to southeastern Oklahoma, uh, and then it would take me to the Tulsa area, and then through circumstances, it took me clear out of full-time church work. 
uh, and, and moved to Texas and working in an industry that I wasn't familiar with, but somehow I landed the job. Um, and then I got laid off from that job and it brought me here. And now I'm working in the tech industry. Uh, something, I mean, I, I have a degree in uh, religion, um, not computers. Um, so there have been a lot of circumstances in my own life where it, it's like, listen, God's going to send you. <laughs> I mean, it, and and the real question is, where are you? And then what are you going to do with that, where you are? Um, when I was pastoring in Sepulpa, uh, at one point we had a fellow who was a church, he was one of our church members, and he, he came in to talk to me and told me that he kind of felt like God was calling him into youth ministry. And um, he had he had a job. Uh, in fact, he had two jobs. He really wasn't uh, interested in going to school for any of that. He didn't know how the process would work. And I said, well, um, I mean, I can, I can kind of give you some ideas of how to get your name out there. But right now, today, what I would tell you is go back to that youth room and work with those kids. I mean, we 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 don't need a youth minister at the moment, but go go do it where you are, um, and then see where where God takes that. And I've asked that question of myself, particularly since I've uh, been out of pastoral ministry, uh, just asking the question all over again when I'm in mortgage servicing. Okay, so how do I? How do I be faithful to uh, a, a faithful witness to God and his work where I am? God has placed me here in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Now, what does that look like where I am? And then when that job came to an end and we moved up here, now it's like, okay, what does it look like now from Mustang? Uh, and, and so I think the question, I, I think those are questions really that we should all ask because I don't, it, you may have been born and raised in Tuttle and you may, have, you may be living in the house that you've always lived in. I, I still think that you should be asking yourself, even if that's the case, what, what would God do through me to make himself known here in my community in ways that haven't happened to this point I, you know w what is there out there for me to do and so like at work I have a team there's a team that I'm on and uh, it's a team of, of about 13 people uh, plus my manager and I view that not as a place for me to preach at them and and all that kind of stuff but I view it as a, an opportunity to build relationships with some of my coworkers, and some probably more than others uh, just because that's kind of how it works out. It's it's who they sit you next to, you know, and that's the person that you have the opportunity to talk to the most. And um, you know, in my case, it's uh, it's an Iraqi refugee who's a Muslim, and um, I mean, committed to his faith. But I, I'll tell you, I I in my lifetime, I have uh, had very few people that I've had m more longer and more intense religious conversations with than I have my Muslim coworker. And there are times, I mean, we're working at home now, but uh, he backs me up when I'm off and I back him up when he's off. We have a, a good working relationship together. And there are times that I'll call him up or he'll call me up and we'll talk for an hour. And, and we'll talk about lots of different things. And very often it migrates to faith and who is God and what do you believe and things like that. Um, honestly, those are opportunities that I never had when I was in the pastorate. And I, I even told them in Sepulpa, I said, I, I, I said, I often envy you out there sitting in the pews because um, I remember when we were in Atoka, Vera and I went to the local golf course one day uh, to golf and we, there were two guys that were there and uh, they asked if we wanted to golf together and we did. And, and I just knew, oh boy, you know, at some point they're going to ask me what I do and it's going to be the big turnoff for them. 
And, uh, you know, we got through probably seven or eight holes before they even asked me what I did, which uh, I thought was kind of remarkable because that usually comes up pretty early. But I mean, you know, they, they were just being good old boys and, um, I, you know, it wasn't too rough, but uh, it, it was PG maybe <laughs> uh, <laughs> out there on the golf course. Uh, and, and they were having a great time and we were having a great time and, and all that. And then one of them asked me, so what do you do here? And I told him, well, I pastor a local church down here. And oh, he looks at his buddy and he's like, I, I, I think we may need to owe him an apology. <laughs> you know, the, the whole dynamic changed. Right. Um, because when you tell somebody, well, I'm a pastor, then it tends very often to just shut off conversation. Well, you know what? Now those conversations are opened up to me in ways that they weren't before. <laughs> and I just look at the place that God has put me as an opportunity to have those conversations uh, with people around me. And so I, that's probably the primary thing that, that I think of when I think of this whole conversation about the mission of God is where, where's God put you, even if it's the same place you've always been. Uh, I think it's important to ask the question, why has God put me here? And it's like you said. Now, I have a team of 13 coworkers and a manager at, at work. The people who are listening to this have a whole different set of coworkers and friends and all of and acquaintances and all of that that I don't even know and I I I may never so that's your mission field that's where God's placed you and and given you an area of influence and and that's why I think it's you know it's valuable some of the things that you do as a pastor to be involved in your community to develop relationships and and uh, that are outside of just a, a normal pastoral relationship as the pastor of Snow Hill Baptist Church whether it's the city council or whether it's calling basketball games whatever it is you know those those are the kind of things that I think we all should seek to do as a part of living out our sentness from God in the world. Yeah. You know, when, when uh, I think of that statement that Jesus makes asserts to the disciples, I'm, I'm left re really working in my mind. We don't know where all 12 went. And we do know that, that at least one probably stayed in and around Jerusalem. So it wasn't that God, that Jesus had in mind that I'm sending you to, I'm going to send you to Africa, or I'm going to send you to um, back to where Abram came from, or I'm going to send you over to uh, Spain or to Rome. Uh, so the variety represented by those Jesus spoke to mirror or inform the varieties of places God sends us. And I'm glad you emphasize the fact that it's where we need, why, why here? Why here? Um, and you need to know, folks, that um, many times the hardest place is to do what God has sent you to do where you've always been. Uh, it's it's a little bit easier for folks when they don't have to um, reckon with people who've known them since they were walking. And because that's what happened with Jesus, remember? Isn't this Joseph's son? That was a that was basically a slap. We've known him. Like, Mary, come get your son, he's causing it. Come on there's some problems here. So uh, I think that, that your emphasis has been, you know, very well placed as we kind of open up how we want to talk about this being who God is. And I think maybe that's a, a, a better way to describe it than try to, you know, narrow down uh, the difference between an attribute and character. I think it's to say this is who God is. And, and so that when when we 
hear Jesus describe the relationship between father and son, we know the spirit's present. So that Trinitarian relationship, having just remember come through the Nicene Creed, that Trinitarian relationship is what contains the who, who God is that as that relationship is enjoyed by father, son, and spirit, the mission is we want to bring others into that relationship. So the very idea of creation itself is the result of a mission sending God who wants to invite people into the divine relationship. Now, listen, folks, that's pretty heady. You can't get any more um, wow than, than spending time trying to figure out the mechanics of Genesis 1 and 2. And sadly, we get lost in trying to uh, nail down the methodology and mechanics of creation and forget that creation is an action of the missionary God who says, we want to share ourselves with others. So we're going to create some others with whom we can share this wonderful, beautiful relationship we have. And so the uh, it, it's not just that we want to emphasize that God is a missionary God, ascending God, but we want to re remind ourselves the thing to which he's calling that activity for, to, for us to be with and in God. So um, it, it just changes the whole shape when we start to have conversations well, God's sending me as a missionary to, and you fill in the blank, and I'm supposed to, you know, announce this. Listen, let's ratchet it up a little bit and say, listen, God has sent you to Tuttle, to wherever you're living, in Mustang, to Dell, or to wherever you work, because there are people who need to be notified that God created the world so that they would have the means to share life with God. Not so God could have some play things, but so that God could share God's self with. I mean, you do not, folks, listen, you do not get that central issue in any other religious framework. Zero. That's not the goal. And so um, I don't want to overplay what we're, what we're wanting to kind of introduce and talk more about as we go along, but I certainly don't want to underplay that this is the reality that God's inviting us into, uh, life with God, and that it's not just some sort of abstraction that the very character of it means that God wants us to enjoy a relationship that's in him that's described as love, self-giving, beautiful, good, true, and we get to be part of that because of God's mission, sending himself to and for us. So that's... That's, it sounds like we're kind of still doing some introduction, and in, in some ways we are, because what Paul said, I, I want to kind of end with and then give Paul last opportunity here, is this. For so much of our lives reading the scriptures, at least if you grew up like we did, the essential distinguishing factor was that you could determine that you, you were this and not that. There were very few instances where it, it's this and that. And if you paid attention to what Paul said a while ago, that we're not trying to say that, you know, there's no need for folks to go as missionaries and live in other parts of the world. We, we are supporting um, a, a young couple right now in another part of the world. We have to be careful what we say on the Internet, but it's another part of the world. That's still happening. That still exists. That's still part of it. But it's also this that Paul described when he, when he gave a little self-testimony about how he viewed working in uh, the mortgage industry and now in technology. 
So it, hopefully you'll hear us not as it's this and not that, but it's this and that. Because uh, it, there, there's just more than trying to narrow down and control what God's mission means. And so what we're really doing is opening up other possibilities that we find in Scripture, have been born out in life, and are reflective of the very person of who God is and reveal himself to us in Jesus. Paul, any last uh, thoughts? Yeah, um, I, I would say that um, just be aware that God has a way of getting us to where he needs us or where he wants us. Um, and as you said, sometimes it is because he has laid something specifically on someone's heart to go and do. I know a young lady that was in our church in Sepulpa, and right now she uh, she just went back recently to where she's been uh, a a planted missionary in Africa, and it's it's what she loves, it's what she is convinced that God has called her to do, and it's what she's doing. Um, but God has a way of getting us where he, we He wants to sometimes just by circumstances. I lost a job in Dallas, and I, I even I didn't have any intention of moving either. Um, I, I was sending out applications for work in the DFW area, and I did that for month upon month upon month, and was told that, man, the the hiring market's hot, and I had. Uh, co-workers who had gotten jobs at other mortgage servicers and would put in a word for me and would give me the name of a recruiter and all of that and none of it worked out. I wasn't getting any call callbacks and um, something here opened up and you know what it was like well I can stay in Dallas in the house that we have there and with my kids in planted in school and all that uh, and and hope that uh, the the bank account doesn't run out before um, you know our our needs are met, or I can take what uh, an opportunity that has been offered me that um, that just involves a relocation. And you know, I mean, I, I could have chosen to stay and and see what happens. Uh, I chose to move instead. Um, cer the circumstances of life just moved me. And there are people in, in our church at Snow Hill that uh, have, uh, they're, they're not a part of Snow Hill anymore because it was just a job move or whatever. It was circumstances. Something came up. Um, so God has a way of getting us where he wants. And it, it may be that there are people that um, even in our church that he would call and say, I want you to go to this specific place. And if that happens, then uh, that person needs to be obedient at that call. But it also happens uh, very often that it's just the circumstances of life. How did the church leave Jerusalem and begin to grow within the larger part of the Roman Empire? Well, there was, there was persecution of the Christians in Jerusalem. And the circumstance, it, it was like, well, we can stay and be uh, stoned to death like Stephen, or we can pack up and go to some place that's a little safer somewhere else. And a lot of them just packed up and went somewhere where it was safer. But then when they got there, it, they, they started looking around saying, okay, well, how do we bring the message of God in Jesus to bear in this new city where we are? And then with the help of Paul and some of the other apostles, churches were planted and, and the work grew. And, and I mean, it's worldwide now. And a lot of that, it, it wasn't all because every single one who went somewhere felt some specific call to a specific place. But a lot of it was just the circumstances of life took them somewhere. And where they were, they asked the question, how would God use me to make himself known in this place? And, uh, and again, I think that's – so, so uh, just to demystify it, I don't think that you have to sit around and, and ask God for a sign. He may give you one, but you don't have to ask him for one. 
uh, you don't have to uh, play rock, paper, scissors. Uh, you don't have to cast lots or, or anything like to, to figure out, oh, what is it? What, what specifically is it that God wants me to do? There may be something specific. And if there is, trust me, he will reveal it to you mm -hmm. in time. Mm -hmm. But in the meantime, even if you don't have a sense that I know exactly what he wants me to do, find something to do where you are that makes his name known where you are. Mm -hmm. And that's doing the work of God and being on the mission of God and participating. Well, it, it's kind of like that book uh, that we're reading says, it's not our mission. It's God's mission that he calls us into and that we participate with him in. Exactly. Uh, but that, that, that happens, you know, wherever we are. So right now there's however many of us at Snow Hill Baptist and we all get to ask God, what would you have me to do here in this place? And listen, if you feel like you've got limitations, physical limitations or whatever, that's okay. Ask, I mean, God knows what you're capable of and, and what you're not. And he's not going to ask you to do something that you're incapable of. The question becomes, given who I am, where I am, what I've got, what I don't have, what do I do to make God's name known in this place? Mm. Yep. Good. Good. Well, see, there you go. Now you know why Paul joins us <laughs> every week. So look, we are about uh, 25 minutes or so from uh, gathering in person for worship or join, you joining us by live stream. I want to thank you for being with us. We'll con continue to pick up this theme, and I'm going to plant a seed. A couple things Paul said came to mind. We are going to, at some point along the way, could be next week, so you'll have to just tune in and find out. Paul and I took a trip, and we spent a week with um, some Southern Baptist missionaries got to hear up close and personal some of the struggles it was for them to be where they were. Some of the joys, certainly, some of the successes, but some of the things that were peculiar to their experience of following God's call to another place. And then we'll have some more personal uh, uh, stories about being sent and understanding it right where we are, because that's the both and that is going to be important as we reflect on how's God's mission get carried out. If it's his, well, he's also determined to use his church. So we are participants in God's mission. And we'll talk some about that as we go along. So just plant a few seeds, probably plant some more along the way. But uh, we're glad to have you this morning. Let me pray for us and then um, give you a little break before time for worship this morning. Lord God, we are glad uh, to use Paul's description that you work in the circumstances of life. God, many of us grew up thinking that we had to know exactly and slide rule everything into its particular proper place. Oftentimes, God, that meant we didn't do anything because we were left just unsure or uncertain. We had some, some lack of sense and, and, and assurance. God, we're glad today that you've reminded us that wherever we are is where you've sent us. And certainly there could be occasions where there is somewhere away from where we are, some particular assignment. But you've called all of us to be yours where we are. Not for our benefit, but really to fulfill what you described to Abram so that all the world, all the people of the world might be blessed. The only way that happens, God, is if we are understanding that you have us right where we may be an opportunity to let folks know about your name, your goodness, your love, and your grace. So give that to us every day this week to think about so that we might always be ready to respond to your, the lead of your spirit who invites everyone into a life with God. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. We'll see you shortly for worship. Take care. Remember to 
reach out to each other. We are looking forward to the days as they draw near that circumstances will be, the circumstances of life will be where we can be together more than we're able to now. So till next time, thanks for being with us.